John? Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, we'll go to our announcements. The annual All Daughters Banquet will be held on Saturday, May 7th. Dinner will be served at 6, and afterwards we will enjoy a time of fellowship and music with Tammy Spicer. To RSVP for the dinner, please sign the sheet on the Welcome Center desk or call the office at 740-283-2239. We hope to see you there. On Saturday, April the 30th, there'll be a spaghetti dinner fundraiser here at Bell Chapel for Chris Tarr's Eagle Scout project. It will be from 3 to 6.30 and the cost is by donation. As graduation is approaching, we at Bell Chapel Church would like to share in this time with you. We are asking you to please bring into the church office a graduation picture and a write-up about yourself. Where are you graduating from, parents, hobbies, accomplishments, future plans, etc. You can also email them to cindy at bellchapel.org. Please have them in by May 15th so we can include them in our June and July newsletter. Okay, if you would all stand for our call to worship. Morning has broken, light has flooded the darkness. Our hearts swell with joy as we think of the empty tomb and proclaim once again, Jesus is not there. Now we understand what Christ said and what God did. Now we can go Christ is risen. Hallelujah. And our hymn 145, Morning Has Broken, verses 1, 2, and 3. Our prayer of invocation, Lord Jesus Christ, help us to be a resurrection people. Remind us that by faith we too have died with you and have been raised with you. May we live life in light of our resurrection. Amen. And now you can be seated and the men are going to sing.
Amen. Thank you, man. Children, as they clear out of here, you can come forward for the children's moment. Legs are feeling a little tired. I'm gonna take a I'm gonna take a seat with you all here today. All right. I have a question for you. Big surprise. I'm always asking you questions, aren't I? Say I didn't know anything about God or faith, but I wanted to know more about God, and I came to you and I said, Help me to know about God. Where can I look? Where can I find some information? What would you tell me? The Bible? Yeah. That's a great word of advice. I could open up the Bible and learn some things about God. What else could you tell me that would be helpful to me? What do you think? Go to church? Yeah, hopefully somebody goes to the church that at some point while they're at church, they learn about God. Otherwise, hey, we're just hanging out, right? So yeah, that's another great advice. Any other ways that we could learn about God that you could say, Ryan, you need to do this? Those are great words of advice. Maybe you all could even say, well, Ryan, let me tell you about God, and you could tell me something. Or you could say, Ryan, you can pray to God, and when you pray to God, he communicates back, and you can learn about him. But there are two scripture verses that I think are really, really cool. And listen to what they say. Um, We'll talk about them, about how else we can learn about God. This is from Romans. It says... For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. That verse says that we can learn about God by looking at what he has made. We can look at creation and learn something about him. Psalm says the same thing. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. So do you think the scripture is right there that by looking at creation we can learn about God? Do you think that's true? I think so too. Just like any artwork, by looking at the artwork like a painting or a drawing, we can learn about the artist. If the art the person the artwork's all about horses, what do you think that says about the artist? They like horses. Yeah, see? But a bing bada boom, it's that easy. Well, since we can learn about God from creation, I brought with me some things. Oh, I brought with me some things from creation. Take a look here. You can check that out. Want to look at this? See this thing? All right, I've got, I'm just going to hold them up for you. This can tell us about God. Well, what's it telling us about God? You all are going to help me to know here. What can you learn about God from this dandelion? Some say it's a flower, some say it's a weed. Hard to tell. What can this tell you about God? What do you think? What do you notice about this? Is it dull in color or bright in color? Bright? Hmm. Maybe God enjoys beautiful things that have bright color, right? You think? I think so. What else do you notice about this dandelion? Would you say that it's disorganized or organized? Did it just come about? Or does it look like it's been like created to look like this? It's been created, right? Do you see how all those little petals kind of come together? You see that? That tells us that God created this and he gave it organization. He made it just the way he wanted it to be. There's other things we can talk about. See, God doesn't make all things to last right now, but someday that'll change. That's what that told us right there. My hope is by doing this, 
for you all that when you're out in God's creation, you'll be able to look at it and really look at it and go, wow, that leaf's pretty cool when you really look at it. And that dandelion's pretty cool. And you know what? That when you do that, it'll make you think of God and how amazing he is. I hope that it'll teach you something about him. Let's pray together here. Heavenly Father, sometimes we wish we could just see you and that we could just sit down and talk to you face to face like we do our family members or other people that are here with us. But Lord, you do talk to us. One of the ways you talk to us is through creation. Lord, I pray that you would help each one of these young women and men to love your creation, to take care of it. But I also pray that when they were, would enjoy your creation, that they would learn about you and that it helped them to see just how awesome you are. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for your help. You can come get your suckers here and then head back to your class. That didn't make it too long, did it? No. <laughs> have the ushers begin to prepare to come forward to get the offering trays so we can collect the offering. Please stand as you're able for the singing of the doxology. Today we celebrate and rejoice the fact that you never turn your back 
on the lost or the broken. You never stop searching or calling out for those that you love. You desire for all of your children to come back home to you so that they can experience wholeness. Jesus, your love is powerful. It does not grow weary. It is so constant in a world where everything changes. Jesus, help us to return to your love time and time again. Holy Spirit, bless this morning's offering so that it may be a vehicle in which your great love is shown to this community and beyond. We pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you. What a beautiful morning we have uh, together, but also outside. I'm sure as you made your way to this place, you noticed that just things are blooming. Birds are singing, just like the the song we sang, and uh, it's just beautiful outside. I, I do want us to have this moment, this special moment, like we have every Sunday, where we're able to join our voices together and approach our God and an attitude of prayer. There were some people and uh, situations that came through the prayer chain this week, so I want to um, lift those up to you in case you hadn't heard. Uh, June Myers has fallen a couple of times here this past week, and she's doing well. She's in the hospital. She's recovering. She's in good spirits. Um, she, yeah, so asked for a prayer. I told her we'd be praying for her. She has had a a lot of people in and out, I think, as far as doctors go and nurses. So she had asked me um, to share with you all that right now uh, she doesn't want any visitors. She's just, like, tired and wanting to, like, relax a little bit. I said, June, makes sense to me. I get it. Um, so I want to pass that along to you that um, she just needs some time to, to chill out a little bit and, and recoup. But uh, we'll lift her up in our prayers. also want to be praying for uh, Doris Perry West younger sister who's had a, a couple of strokes here in a short period of time and um, just she needs our prayer so we'll be lifting her up also uh, Harry Kellermeyer who's working through uh, some health concerns we'll be praying for him and also there was a young man uh, 20 or early 20s who had passed away in a, a motorcycle accident uh, here recently so we're going to be lifting up that young man his family and his friends, all those who are um, trying to wrap their mind around such a, a tremendous loss. So those are the things I'll be praying for. But as always, you all will have an opportunity to raise your pr uh, prayer concerns, but also your joys to the Lord as well. Let's sing Jesus Loves Me, verse 1, and then we'll pray. Heavenly Father, as your beloved children, as your people that have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, we come before you. Lord, hear our prayers and grant us your mercy.
we lift up our, our sister in faith, June, to you, Lord. We pray that during this time where she's experienced a couple of falls and she's not at home but in the hospital, that your love and your mercy would be upon her. And, Lord, we pray that you would uh, continue to protect June and keep her faith strong. Lord, we also are thinking of uh, Perry West's sister, Doris, who's having... Um, health concerns, in particular, who has suffered a couple of strokes, and um, maybe there's some uncertainty just about moving forward for her, and Lord, I pray for, for Doris, her physically, but also just spiritually and emotionally and mentally as well, and Lord, I pray that you would do a mighty work in Doris in her life, and that she would know that you love her, and that you care about her, and that you're with her, and that her faith would be strengthened during this time. Lord, be with Harry as he um, has some health concerns of his own that he's journeying through. Um, provide him your strength. Be with the doctors and nurses that are uh, caring for him. Give them your guidance. Be with Tracy as she helps to care for him and be with her in her spirits as well. Lord, we think of this young man who passed away in the motorcycle accident and just the uh, uh, devastating uh, ripple effect that it is causing as friends and family members grieve and mourn his loss. Lord, even in the midst of such a terrible thing, such a sad and painful thing, we pray that your resurrection hope would be in the midst. We pray that your peace and your joy and your promise of a better tomorrow, that it would be stirring now in the friends of those family members, in the hearts of those family members and friends. Lord, this seems so much for all of us, but we know that you have wide shoulders and that you can do the unthinkable. Jesus, as your disciples today, we join all the disciples throughout the ages in praying your prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this is a new day, a new morning, and we uh, have much to be thankful for. Before we go any further in the service, I do want to cast our minds back to last Sunday just for a, a brief moment here. Wasn't last Sunday just a beautiful moment together? Think back to the service last week, and um, it was a blessing to me to hear all those voices singing worship to God and just the hear such a loud noise in this sanctuary. It was such a blessing uh, for me to see friends and family members smiling and huddled together close in the pews and hugging one another after the service. Not too long ago when COVID was going crazy, many of us might have wondered if something like that would ever happen again or how long it would be until we could experience something like that again. I know COVID's not completely gone by any means, but w what a blessing that God had allowed for us to experience what we experienced last Sunday and to get to join together. It's not something to take for granted, and I just want to make sure we have a moment just to be aware of what God is doing, what he did, and to be grateful for it. Also want to cast your memory back just for a second about the sermon. Last week we talked about how the resurrection was a new day one and how the resurrection ushered in a new era that you and me get to live in right now. That means that as we speak, as I speak, and you listen anyways for right now, that God is doing something amazing. He's in the process of recreating everything. His restoration efforts are in full gear. Nobody 
has been closer to experiencing God's renewed creation than you and I are right now. That's a blessing. Some other blessings because of the new day one brought about by the resurrection. If you're a believer, as a believer, you are forgiven. You're not waiting for God to do some decisive thing to save you. He's already done it. You can have confidence as a child of God that your transgressions are forgiven in full. Your debt has been paid in full. As a believer, death no longer gets the final say in your life. As a believer, hope is always before you. You always have reason to be hopeful, even when things aren't the greatest. As a believer, you can live by this motto, and I've been trying to remind myself of it so I can live by it. As believers, do you know what our motto is? The best is yet to come. And we can say that and really believe it. It's not just a little cheesy bumper sticker that we, like, no. For us, the best really is yet to come. And you know why we know all of these things? The resurrection. That's what I shared last week. The resurrection of Jesus proves that everything I just said is, in fact, truth. You can, it's reliable. You can take it to the bank. Since you can tell that the resurrection is central to everything we believe, it's the linchpin of our faith walks and our entire belief system, everything we have built ourselves upon is the resurrection. It's our foundation. I want us to hear these words from Paul and just see how they strike you. So the resurrection is important. Listen to how Paul puts it. See what you think about this. I'll be reading 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 20. This is what he says. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. You know, every time I read these verses, every time, it like cuts me right to my heart. It cuts me right to my soul. It fills me with, with wonder and appreciation. I really appreciate how the Apostle Paul here, he's not giving us fluffy words. He's not mincing his words. He goes right to the question, the topic that needs to be reflected upon. Every time I read this scripture, it even fills me with a little bit of uh, a bit of fright. It's frightening to me. Listen to what Paul says. If Jesus did not experience resurrection, our faith is useless. If the resurrection didn't happen, Paul says that we are to be pitied. Our lives are pitiful. If Jesus didn't really experience resurrection, you and I, we've been dedicating ourselves to a lie. You heard Paul say that. Isn't that a frightening thought to some degree? See, he's right. I think all of you can say, yeah, he's getting to something. If, If it didn't happen, what are we doing? What have we spent the last years of our lives doing? So much is riding on one event, and this event took place like 2,000 years ago. I wasn't there to see it. Were any of you there to see it? Right? Nobody's there to see it? Okay. It's like, come see me after the service if you were around. We need to have a talk. Uh, We weren't there to see it. How do we know it happened? 
what if I'm basing my life on a lie that's frightening? As a pastor, this is really, really, really scary because I get up in front of people and I tell them about the resurrection and I tell them about faith and hopefully I do it in a way that God blesses it and they go, yeah, I want that for me too. Listen to what Paul said about teachers, those who profess the resurrection. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God if Jesus wasn't raised from the grave. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. Paul is saying all people of faith are in a really bad way if Jesus wasn't resurrected. But really, the teachers, the people that are telling others about Christ's resurrection are false witnesses if it didn't happen. They're proliferating a lie. Paul goes through this getting right to the topic and getting right to the fact that everything rests upon the resurrection. And then I love <laughs> how he puts it in verse 20. It was the last verse we read. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He goes on to consider it, but then he doubles down and he says with great surety, but Christ has been raised. Paul was confident that the resurrection really happened. But I want to know, can we today here in the year 2022, can we have the same confidence that Paul had? Can we believe that the resurrection happened without a shadow of a doubt, like Paul did? Well, that's what we're going to consider this morning. We're going to take some time to, to think of this together. The first thing we need to see when we talk about the resurrection and if it really happened is that from the very beginning, people have been saying that it didn't take place. From the very beginning, there have been people saying that it didn't happen how we think, believers think it happened. Let's check this out. Paul wrote the scripture we just read in 1 Corinthians, and this is why. This is from another verse. Some were saying that there was no resurrection of the dead. Paul didn't just sit down one day and go, huh, I'm going to write this long letter about Jesus being raised from the grave just because. No, people in his day were saying that it didn't happen. So he sat down to write the letter because he's like, hey, somebody's got to address this. They're, they're telling lies about what took place, and I need to set them straight. Can you imagine what that must have been like for Paul and the first disciples of Jesus, you know, to try to get this new movement, this new church off the ground, to try to go and tell others about the gospel message and how frustrating that must have been for other people to be going around and saying that what you were telling others was a lie. That had to be so frustrating for them to want to spread this message all around and to know that while they were doing that, other people were going, don't listen to them. They're telling you false accounts. It wasn't only people in Paul's time that were saying that the resurrection didn't happen. Listen to what we find moments after Jesus left the grave. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that, that deceiver, Jesus, said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. This is what happens after they find the empty tomb. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. That everything that had happened was that an angel had appeared, the stone had been rolled back, Jesus' body was no longer there. Listen to what the chief priests say. They devised a plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. 
And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Jesus leaves the grave, and the first one, some of the first people that see that the tomb is empty, they begin telling <laughs> other people that it was all a fabrication, that the disciples had come and taken his body. The Jewish leaders, they knew that something miraculous had taken place with the resurrection. And they didn't want people to know that they had, in fact, crucified the Son of God. So they were trying to nip it in the bud right away. Do we still try to disprove the resurrection today, do you think? Have you ever heard anybody say that the resurrection is just a fairy tale, a myth? Oh, yeah. You better believe that there are many people today that try to discredit the resurrection that it happened. Many people today will say that Jesus was a man, he was a good man, he was a great teacher, but he was just a man. A man who died like every man before him and like every man after him. They don't believe that the resurrection could have taken place. They say, you see, I'm a logical person and science can't prove that somebody could be brought back from the grave. To believe that, you'd have to be a fool. I'm too smart to believe in something like that. I'm a logical person, they'll tell you. Everything rides on the resurrection. From the very beginning, all the way up through today, people are trying to say that the resurrection didn't happen. So where does this leave us <laughs> as people of faith. What are we supposed to make of all this? Do we have reason to believe it happened or not? We do. We do. If I figured out preparing the sermon that we had no reason to believe what we believed, I just wouldn't even have showed up today. Like I just would have moved away somewhere and been like, eh, this was all. We have so many reasons to believe that the resurrection took place. The Longer I follow Jesus or do my best to follow Jesus, this is what I've come to understand about our faith. God doesn't give us all the answers. We're never going to be able to put everything in nice, tidy order and go, oh, everything's in line. I can know without a shadow of a doubt that this happened. But you know what? God also doesn't call us to have a blind faith with no evidence or no reason at all. God doesn't say, if you're going to believe in me and be one of my followers, you have to set your brain to the side and just believe in something that makes zero sense. He doesn't give us all the answers, but he gives us a lot of evidence to believe what we believe. Here's evidence number one that's going to help us to have firm grounding that the resurrection actually took place. The first thing we need to look at is the timeline. The accounts of Jesus leaving that tomb, it came about during the time period right after Jesus' life on earth. Right after Jesus left the tomb, orally, by word, the account of what happened there began to proliferate all around the city of Jerusalem and beyond. This is why the Jewish leaders had to try to stuff it down and say it didn't happen because this message was starting to gain steam that Jesus was the Son of God and that death couldn't contain him. The tomb couldn't contain him. Not only orally did this message of the resurrection begin to happen right after it happened, but in writing, it happened very soon after Jesus' death as well. Many historians think that 1 Corinthians that we just read from a bit ago, that it was written like 20 years after Jesus left the tomb. You know the telephone game? Like where you tell somebody something and they have to pass it? The more people you have in the chain, what happens to the message? It gets worse and worse, right? So this is important. Because the account is happening so soon after it took place, we know that the account is a reliable one. If Paul didn't write 1 Corinthians until 200 years after Jesus left the tomb, we'd be going, think of how the message could have been distorted in the 200 years until it was written down. You see what I'm saying? This account didn't generate 
by somebody's imagination. No, no, no. That orally was passed and it was written down and then spread soon after it took place. Reason number two, we can believe that the resurrection really happened is there were eyewitnesses. And I'm not talking one or two, I'm talking hundreds. This is what Paul writes in another part of 1 Corinthians. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Do you hear? There were a ton of witnesses that saw the resurrected Christ, not just the empty tomb. Like, they had a conversation with Jesus after he was dead and rose again. Matthew, um, the, the soldiers took a bribe to proliferate a lie that the disciples stole the body. And Matthew told us that that lie has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. 1 Corinthians, he appeared to people that are living right now. The gospel writer and Paul is making claims about what they saw and what took place. And do you see what they're saying? They're like, and if you don't believe me, go ask around. Because there are people that saw it with their own eyes. And you can sit down and talk to them. If you can't take my word for it, go talk to one of the 500 and see what they have to say. Because they saw it too. Do you see if you were going to make up a lie, you could never do it this way. If I made up a lie that there was a Tyrannosaurus Rex walking up 213 that I saw on Tuesday and that there were 400 people outside of their homes that saw it too, you know how far that lie would get? Not very far. Because after you heard me and didn't believe me, you would go to one of the 400 people and they'd be like, we never saw that. That's dumb. Don't believe it. The gospel writers in Paul, they're saying something amazing and they could only do that with the people still living, the other eyewitnesses, if it was the truth. And there were 500 other people that said, yeah, I know, it's hard to believe. But that's, that's, what, that's what happened. We saw it. Reason number three. Have you ever noticed in the Bible that it's women that find the tomb empty first? Have you ever noticed that? It's the... Mary Magdalene in one account, but it, it's women who find the tomb empty and are the first evangelizers. They're the first gospel spreaders. They're the first ones that are going and saying, hey, we saw the resurrected Christ. Women don't get mad about this. We believe you today most of the time. Back then, a woman couldn't give a testimony in court. Like legally, they weren't able to testify in court. You know why the gospel writers are saying that the women were the first ones to see and to tell others about the empty tomb? It's not helping their case for other people to believe it because women's word back then was incredible. You know why every gospel says that? That's how it happened. If they were going to make this up, they wouldn't say that the women were the first ones to find the empty tomb because that wouldn't strengthen their case. But instead, they're saying that it took place because that's who found it first. And they were the first ones to tell others about it. Uh, a commentator, N.T. Wright, says this, There would have been enormous pressure on the gospel writers to skip over this part about the women being the first one to find the empty tomb and just get to where Jesus appears to the disciples, men. But the truth was recorded in, in a way, had to be recorded that way. The story had already been spread wide and far. People already knew that the women were the first ones there. This, the writers had to put it that way because it was the truth. All right. This resurrection story went against all belief systems of that time. 
And this is another evidence for us that it really happened as we read about it. Sometimes people today will say, well, those people back then in the first century, they weren't very smart and they aren't as clever as we are today and they didn't have science and technology to disprove everything. And back then, they believed in the afterlife and they were just waiting, you know. Um, so it would have been easy for them you know, maybe somebody did steal Jesus' body, and of course, when they saw the empty tomb, they just said, oh, he resurrected, because that's just how people back then thought, but not us today. That's a lie. Nobody expected things to go how they went. Nobody would have been able to make up such a lie because it was so unfathomable to them. Back in that day, there was Greek belief. And they believed that the spirit world was like pure and holy, but the physical material world was evil. So no Greek would have made up a lie that a spirit left its evil body and then went back into its body again. The Greeks would have never been able to make up a lie like that. Why would a liberated spirit go back to being imprisoned to its evil body? Wouldn't have made sense to them. Do you see how this resurrection account of Jesus coming back to life and taking his body with him, how it would have flown in the face of what the Greek people believed at the time. And the Greek worldview, that was like the prevalent worldview in the, in the Roman Empire. That's how most people thought. What about the Jewish people, the Jewish belief? They saw the spiritual and the material as both being good, but you know how they thought it was all going to go? They thought that the Messiah would come back at the end times, that he would fix everything, that he would bring about justice and liberation, and he would defeat evil once and for all. And then at the very end of time, everybody who had passed away prior, they all would have been raised at the same time. That's how the Jewish people thought. The Jews could have never imagined that a single person would be resurrected in the middle of history that flew in the face of everything they believed as well. The account we have of Jesus, a single man, in the middle of history being brought back from the grave, it was unthinkable to those when it happened. It's reason to believe that how we read it is described that way because that's actually how it went. Last evidence here, hopefully this is helping you to see that we don't have blind faith, that we're not giving all of our hope to something that has no merit. The last reason, and maybe one of the best reasons we have for why the resurrection is real, why it really happened, is this. Think of what happened in the days, months, and years that followed the resurrection. A movement like the world has never seen before. This message spread literally to the ends of the earth. People, millions of people, devoted their lives to it. There were many people who claimed to be the Messiah before Jesus, and we don't even know any of their names anymore. You know why? When they died, they died. They didn't come back and start talking to 500 people. But Jesus... He claimed to be the Messiah, and he was different. That's evidenced by the fact that this huge movement began because of him. Sometimes the proof is in the pudding. And we have a lot of proof to believe the resurrection happened. Look at us here today. 2,000 years later, we still believe. We're still coming to church. We're still praying. We're still worshiping. We're still reading scripture. Something happened all the way back then that is making us do that now. The church, early church, believed even when they were persecuted. Listen to what happened to the apostles and tell me you don't think they believed in what they were preaching. Paul, beheaded in Rome. Do you think he was proliferating a lie and was willing to die for a lie? He was willing to die in Rome because he knew what he was telling others was the truth. Peter, crucified in Rome, requested to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die how his Lord died. Do you think Peter was willing to be crucified upside down for a lie? Of course not. Andrew, what do you think happened? 
crucified. It's not looking very uh, good for the <laughs> believers back then. Thomas spread the gospel in modern day Syria and even as far as east as far east as India, believed to be killed by the spear of four soldiers. Philip spread the gospel in Africa, cruelly put to death. James stoned and clubbed to death. Matthias, death by burning. The earliest followers of Jesus, the early church leaders, were all willing to go to the stake for their faith because they knew that their faith was not misguided. They knew that it was truth. They were willing to die because they had seen Jesus rise up themselves. There's a philosopher who puts it this way. I believe those witnesses that get their throats cut. I believe those witnesses that are willing to die for what they're witnessing to. We got good evidence to believe what we believe. We do need faith. I'm not saying you don't have to have faith. You have to have faith to believe that this really happened and to believe that, um, that it still informs us today. But you don't have to have blind faith. You don't have to cast your logic, your reason to the side. You can be a smart person and be a believer. You can be a logical person and be a believer. And with this quote from Tim Keller, maybe it'll be thought-provoking to you. It definitely is to me. Nothing in history can be proven the way we can prove something in a laboratory. However, the resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact much more fully attested much more fully attested to than most other events of ancient history we take for granted. Many of the things we take for granted have less evidence going for them than the resurrection does. Let's pray together. Jesus, we are living in a time like all time that has come before in which people will try to disprove that you died and rose again. And if they can disprove that, everything else goes with it because that's what we've built our entire lives upon. Jesus, help us to have faith today. Help us to see that our faith isn't misguided. It's not a blind faith that even though we weren't there to see it happen, we have very, very, very good reason to believe that it happened just as Scripture says it did. Lord, knowing that we have so much evidence for our faith, help us to live into our faith more and more and more. Help us not to be Christians that kind of straddle the fence and have one foot in your world and one foot in the world's world. Help us to be Christians that are all in and following you, who aren't divided, but who give ourselves fully to you. We pray this all in your name. Amen. As you're able, please stand. We're going to sing the closing hymn, Blessed Assurance, and we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 3.
Amen. I know for some of you today it was probably like, Pastor Ryan, we believe just because we believe. We don't really need to know. Like, we just believe, man. Like, just let us be. I can guarantee you that there are many people in your family, friend group that you're going to come across that aren't able to just believe just because. And they're going to need some evidence. Go forth to give them the evidence that we have of the resurrection. Go in peace.